Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Can we please turn to page two of the bulletin and uh, let's pray the prayer for illumination. Together, guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is taken from Amos chapter 7, verses 10 to 17. <clears throat> then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from the native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go out, you seer, see go back to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any more at battle, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up and you yourself will die in a pagan country, and Israel will certainly go into exile away from the native land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Before I start this morning's sermon, I want to thank Dr. Lin for all the kind words he said about me. But just believe 20% of what he said. That will be fine. Yeah, it was true that I was once his boss. But what he forgot to mention, or deliberately I think so, is that later on, years later, when I joined a private school, he became my boss. It reminds me of what a friend of mine said, which I think so is a great lesson. He says, Be nice to people when you are going up because you don't know when you are going to meet them when you are coming down. That's exactly what happened to me. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you, Lord, we can praise you. And now, oh God, we thank you that we, you have given us your word that we can learn of you. We continue to remember our church leadership in PT, Lord. You be with them as they seek your guidance for the year 2015. And so, oh God, Lord, now you gather our thoughts, quiet our hearts and minds as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. The passage read to us. Chapter 7, verse 10 to 17 from the book of Amos. 
Amos was a 8th century BC prophet. He was a resident of Teco, a small little town near Bethlehem in Judah. By profession, he was a shepherd, a herdsman, and a grower of fruit trees. Scripture tells us in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Amos, you can get all this information. He was a grower of sycamore tree, which produces an edible fruit, something like figs. He was a country folk. He lived in a rural area. He is not a city dweller like us. His vast knowledge of history and regional politics, however, belied his kampong background. Clearly, he was not a katak di bawa tempurung. He was quite well informed. In fact, he knew politics, current politics of his time very, very well. And when God called him, he made a career change from a farmer or a herdsman or a shepherd to become a prophet, big quantum leap. Moving from the southern kingdom of Judah to do his prophetic work in the northern kingdom, Israel. For those of us who may not know Israel's history very well, just to recap, after the death of King Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was split into two. The northern part consisting of the, two tri of the ten tribes was referred to as Israel, while the southern part consisting of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin was referred to as Judah. Jeroboam the first, the first king of the northern kingdom, established state centuries in Bethel and Dan, two towns as centers of worship for this northern kingdom. The reason is very simple. He doesn't want his people to travel down all the way to the south to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. And therefore, there's a danger that they may give their allegiance there. We read this in 1 Kings chapter 12. So what Jeroboam the first did was he erected golden calves, reminder of what happened at the Sinai Desert. He erected golden calves as cultic symbols. He rejected the Levitical priesthood and he ordained priests from all sorts of people. He himself even offered sacrifices in the temple that he set up in the town of Bethel. Now Jeroboam took all these steps in a very calculated move to break the relationship between the north and the south. He wanted the temple to reflect his own dynasty. He wanted it to reflect his own state religion that the temple that he created in Bethel be an expression of his monarchy and an instrument of his politics. That's the background. And it was in this temple at Bethel that the prophet Amos met the high priest of this temple in Bethel, Amaziah. And the passage that we read just now refers to their encounter at this particular temple. Unlike Hosea, the prophet who emphasized a lot about God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, and God's forgiveness, Amos, Hosea's contemporary, they were about the same time, was a rigorous spokesman of God's justice and righteousness. God provided Israel with two types of people. One who preaches God's love, the other who preaches God's judgment. And here we see that we must keep in tension the attributes of God. Some of us are so happy that God is love, nothing else but God is love. Well, others sees God's holiness and judgment and preach fire and brimstone. I tell we as Christians, you and I, 
should keep these two attributes in tension. Now Amos declared to the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, that God is going to judge them for their unfaithfulness, for their disobedience, and for their covenant-breaking behavior. The dominant theme in the book of Amos is found in chapter 5, 24, where Amos called for social justice as the indispensable expression of true piety. Let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never falling, never failing stream. This is the Christian life. No point having a lot of theology, no point having a lot of church attendance. If there is no social justice, if we do not treat our fellow men, all our piety comes to nothing. Amos was often called a prophet of doom because of his message of judgment against Israel and against all the other surrounding nations. And nobody likes to hear such a message, be it then or now. It was an unpopular message. The Israelites had been so accustomed to thinking that they were God's special people, that they were God's chosen people, and that God is duty-bound to care for them, to provide for them, and to protect them from all their enemies. While this may be true, as spelled out in the Sinai Covenant, the Israelites had conveniently chose to forget that there is a Calvert to this Sinai Covenant, that they were to obey the laws of God and to walk in His ways. This, the Israelite nation obviously have not kept. In chapter 2, 4, verse 4, we read, the Israelites, they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept their degrees because they have gone astray, because they have been led astray by false gods. They did not keep the, their sight of the bargain. Throughout the oracles of Amos in, the, in his ministry in the northern kingdom, Amos accused the Israelites of two transgressions, injustice to one another, the rich and the powerful exploiting the poor, and their worship of idols, deserting the Almighty God. And these two evils are still prevalent in our society today, 29 centuries after Amos' preaching, that we still find poor underdeveloped nations being exploited by powerful rich nations by very unfair trade treaties or trade pacts. At our doorstep, we find that migrant workers and the poor and needy work in sweat factories for peanuts while their multinational owners reap obscene profits. People no longer worship the God who created the universe. But they worship, they each after the God of this world. Money and more money. And sell their souls to this false God. Amos is calling the Israelite nation and is calling the church today to return back to its fundamentals. That true piety we cannot have true piety unless there is social justice. And the church must go back to this fundamental. And very pleasantly, we were clearly reminded last Monday, 6 October, we were reminded by the newly installed Archbishop of Kuala Lumpur of the Catholic Church, the Most Reverend Father Julian Liao Beng Kip who said immediately after his installation that his first mission is to help four groups of people, the last, the lost, the least, and the little, the four L's. 
He is right on target on what the mission of the church should be. Because of their failure to repent, after repeated warnings, Amos, speaking on behalf of God, said that judgment will surely come. And we saw that fulfillment of that warning in 722 BC, when the Assyrian army invaded Israel and sent it into exile. And from that day onwards, the ten northern tribes was wiped out of the map until today. The same, I believe, will be true in our time for nations and individuals who practice these two transgressions against their fellow men and against the Almighty God. Now, the job of an Old Testament prophet was a high-risk profession and not rewarding at all. For example, Jonah, he was asked to go to Nineveh, even though he hated the place and the people there. Worse still, they were asked to carry a message that nobody wants to hear. And people get agitated, irritated, fed up with what they have to say. Sometimes riots follow their preaching and they have to be rescued or flee for their lives as in the case of the Apostle Paul. Prison was their second home, as seen in the Apostle Peter and the early Christians. Jeremiah was thrown into a big cistern for telling the truth about the impending Babylonian invasion and its subsequent exile. The Bible is littered with accounts of the sufferings of the faithful, who spoke the truth and got into trouble with the authorities of the day. The Apostle Paul seemed to imply that this is the expected default outcome. In Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3.12, the Apostle Paul wrote, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Frightening, isn't it? And this pattern has not changed since then. Today, we still read of persecutions of God's modern-day prophets, of Christians far and near, right at this moment, in Syria, in Iraq, in Middle East, in China, and even at, the door, at our doorsteps. The scripture tells us in 1 Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But the reality of it all is we Malaysian Christians, we are surprised when persecution comes, when discomfort comes, when opposition comes. So the first lesson we can learn from this encounter between Amos and Amaziah is to expect opposition, persecution, and trials in our Christian service. I would even add, in our Christian living. And this trust comes in all shapes and sizes, and from different quarters. It may range from minor insinuations in our workplace about our faith to martyrdom because of our faith, again in Syria, in Iraq at the moment, and even to the minority ethnic groups. That these people are being slaughtered by ISIS jihadists because they refuse to convert to their brand of Islam. In Amos' case, he met his opposition surprisingly, not from pagans or unbelievers, but from the religious authorities, from the priests at the sanctuary in battle. It was not in pagan territory 
that he had opposition. But in a so-called holy place, the sanctuary in Bethel, and Bethel, you know, has great spiritual significance. It was the place where their forefathers, Jacob, wrestled with the angel of God. Jesus encountered the same scenario in his three-year ministry. That Jesus did not actually encounter a lot of opposition from the ordinary folk. It was the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. And you find that it was the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, that plotted <coughs> to kill and finish off Jesus. They did not like his preaching be it in the synagogue, in the temple, or in the public square. In my own personal experience, a lot of my disappointments in Christian service has its source in people who claim to be Christians, some of whom in positions of authority. Sad, but it's true. The priest at battle, Amaziah, accused Amos that his preaching was against the king and the nation. In verse 10, Amaziah sent a message to the king with these words. Amos was, is raising a conspiracy against you at the very heart of Israel. Now, this tactic is still a proven method to get your enemy into trouble against king against nation, against religion. If Israel had a law on sedition, that, would, that law would have applied on Moses because his message supposedly threatened national security. To conspire implied that Amos was plotting to overthrow the king by illegal means. Look at what Amaziah, the priest of battle, report to the king in verse 11. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will go into extra, away from their native land. This was not an exact transcript of what Amos preached. Amos' preaching can be found in verse 9, two verses before that. And this is what Amos said. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, the Lord says, I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam. Amos, Amaziah makes it seem that Amos was threatening to kill the king. But this was never part of Amos' message. What he spoke was about the coming judgment of God upon Israel. And so the second lesson that we can learn from this encounter is that enemies of God will purposely misinterpret and misrepresent the Christian message to make it look bad, really bad. Christian aid workers and charitable organizations have often been accused of being spies of Western imperialists. NGOs that reach out to the poor, underprivileged, and the migrant workers have often been accused of having hidden motives and sinister agenda, when in reality, many of these NGOs just want to help their fellow men to have a decent living. Jesus warns us in Matthew 5, 11, that false accusations, misinterpretation and misrepresentation are a reality in our Christian walk. Matthew 5, 11 says, people will insult you, the Lord tells us, warns us, people will insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. The third lesson that we can learn from this passage 
is to expect temptations in our Christian service. Temptations existed since the time of Adam and Eve. It is the devil's way of putting a desire in our hearts, in wanting to get what God never intended us to have. And this is a time, also a time-proven tactic by the devil, which has caused the fall of many servants of God. Satan uses the 3G formula, nothing to do with the third generation broadband, or Wesley's grow, glow, and go. <coughs> Satan's 3G is glory, girls, and go. From TV evangelists, pastors, priests, to ordinary lay Christians, the Christian church is scandalized by improper relationships with the opposite sex. And more recently, even in same-sex relationships. The ongoing trial of a mega church in Singapore highlights the other two, G, the other two Gs, glory and go. The church, that, that particular church in Singapore, was trying to seek glory and fame in the secular music world and the mismanagement of church funds for purposes that they are not intended. Good governance of church finances pose a constant temptation to the church and especially in stand-alone independent churches where there is no proper check and balance. In Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11, we have the story of the temptation of Jesus after his 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. Satan used elements of this 3G formula on Jesus. 1 Peter 5 8 warns us as Christians today to be on constant guard. Be self control and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And that someone can be anyone. You and I are on his radar screen. We need to be on guard. Lest whatever small little ministries that we may have be derailed by just a moment of carelessness or indiscretion. In, this, in his encounter with Amos Zion, Amos was tempted, subtly tempted, I would put it, in three ways. We read in verse 12, this is what Amaziah said to Amos. Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Now, the word go in the Hebrew language in this particular context carries the emphasis for your own sake. Go away for your own sake. So, how was the temptation presented? First, we will say that Amaziah tempted Amos to take care of his own self-interest first. Take care of yourself. Go for your own sake. Amos was tempted to forego his mission to the north, to save his own skin, to avoid the backlash of the political and religious authorities. Secondly, Amos was tempted by success. This is what Amaziah told him. Go back to the land of Judah. Go back to your homeland and do your prophesying there and you will be more successful. Implied. Why? Because you know the historical background. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom are never in good terms. They hated each other. And so if Amos were to go down to the south and preach a message of fire and brimstone on the north, 
everybody will applaud my enemy. Anything bad about my enemy is good to the ear. And he will be very successful. People will gather to hear his sermon. People will support what he said. So he will be successful. Third, Amos was subtly tempted by financial security. Earn your bread there. For Amaziah, the office of a prophet is a job, a career, a way of earning a living. Thinking that Amos was like him, Amaziah told him, you go back to Judah, there will be job security for the same reason, that your message will be accepted by the southerners. And if the, your message is popular, there's a crowd around you, obviously, there will be more free will offerings. You will be successful. And therefore, the next lesson, the fourth lesson that we can learn from this encounter is when we are in Christian service, whatever we are doing in church to examine our own motives, why we are doing what we are doing. We need to examine our motives, that we are, what we are involved in, so that it must not be tainted by personal gain. We are human, and the law of power, status, popularity, control, money, lust, is an ever-present reality. And Satan can use any of this to finish off our Christian ministry. Then in verse 13, Amaziah brings his official status to bear, and he issued a degree. Verse 13, don't prophesy any more battle, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. You cannot preach this sermon or use this word or use this terminology because it belongs to us. Sounds familiar, isn't it? Furthermore, Amos was a pendatang from the south. Today is no different. The church has been prevented from sharing his message, from using particular words and terminology in many places. Such restrictive measures, again, is not new. The early first century apostles had to contend with it, and it had been down through the ages. In Acts 5.28, we read, this is what the Sanhedrin, the high priest, the religious authority during the first century in Palestine. This is what they tell the apostles. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. It occurred 20 centuries ago, so we should not be surprised. Peter's reply was short and sweet in the next verse in Acts 5.29. We must obey God rather than man. Amos must be very proud of Peter. He was never cowed by the religious of the day. And therefore, you find that the next thing we must be realistic about, be real about, is that in our Christian ministry, confronting authorities is unavoidable. We hope not to. We don't intentionally want to confront. But if push turn to show, that's it. Now the man of God, in whatever we do, must rest on his divinely given authority. Not who am I, or what I can do, or what I'm trained to do. And Amos' reply to Amaziah was straightforward. When Amaziah tell Amos, hey, you palate kampong and stop doing what you are doing. Amos replied in verse 15. But the Lord took me from tending the sheep, the flock, and said to me, 
Go prophesy to my people Israel. Amos knew exactly his mission, who called him. He knew exactly what to do. Amos tell Amaziah, he sum up his mission in very short words. Not I, but the Lord who sent me to battle to do this job. He stressed his sending authority. The Lord said to me, Go, do what? Prophesy to whom? My people Israel. His job description, his target audience was very clear. Amos underlined his authority by a rebuttal and an affirmation. And it's very important in Christian service that in whatever we do, we must be above board in all our actions. No self-interest, no personal glory. Amos denied that he wanted to be a prophet. Amos denied that he was a self-appointed prophet. Amos denied that he seek training to become a prophet. He said it. He made it very clear that he was not, he was a herdsman. He was not a prophet. He never intended to become a prophet. Neither was it his ambition to become a prophet. And he said that he was not a prophet's son. That doesn't mean that his father was a prophet. It means that he did not seek out a prophet to be his sifu, to learn how to prophesy. And he tells Amaziah that he never desired want to become a prophet because he did not enroll himself in a prophet school. In fact, he says that he was very happy in his rural life as a farmer in the kampong. He stressed that his appointment is from the Lord. Verse 15, he said, The Lord took me. He was conscripted and he became what he was not. He became a prophet. And therefore, you find that Amos knew exactly where he stood with God and what he was supposed to do. No wonder Amos, we are told, is a prophet who fears no man. Second thing we learn about Amos is this, that he was also a man faithful to God's word. Amaziah told him not to preach. Don't prophesy anymore in battle. But Amos says in verse 16 and 17a, Now hear the word of the Lord. <coughs> you say, don't prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I did not put up what he said on the PowerPoint because it's not very pleasant. Anyway, I'll read it. This is what the Lord said. Your wife shall be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself shall die in a clean, unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile from this land. Amos did not shirk his responsibility to declare the word of the Lord however unpleasant it may be, whether to a nation or to an individual. The man of God is faithful to the word of God. Why Amos was able to withstand all the oppos opposition in his ministry? Because he knows his calling and he was faithful to the word of God in all circumstances. So the lesson that we learn in verse 6, in lesson 6, know your calling, be faithful to the word of God in all circumstances.
verse 15, verse 17 carries a warning to all those who oppose the word of God. That those who oppose the word of God should take heed that the preaching of God's word will go forth as God planned it to be, as God decreed it to be. Man may be able to put up obstacles, to put up roadblocks, to cause pain to the servants of God. But the purpose of God can never be sabotaged. Then we need to take heed for those who oppose the word of God, that there are also personal and societal consequences when people reject the word of God. A Messiah not only brought ruin to himself, but to his family and to the nation. Amos' indictment on him in verse 17 was indeed very, very, very harsh. A price that all who oppose the word of God must be prepared to pay. This pronouncement most probably became a reality and a nightmare for Amaziah when some years later, the Assyrians invaded Israel in 722 BC and the nation went into exile and was heard no more. We must remember that our actions, our reactions to the word of God affect our family. As members of a family are bound in unity and solidarity. While it is true that we have to individually answer for our sins before God, our actions will have reverberating effects on our family and to a, and to a wider extent, the society in which we are situated. A drug addict, for example, not just destroy himself, he brings much misery to his family members and of course a nuisance to the community that he lives in. I believe that in some ways all of us are in some form of Christian ministry. We are doing something for the Lord. We may not be missionaries in some far away countries. But we all have our tiny little mission field. That our area of Christian service may be in some obscure corner that nobody seems to notice. Or you and I may be doing something which we ourselves never taught it to be Christian service. Whether you are just making coffee for the afterwards refreshment or visiting a sick person in the hospital, or giving English tuition to some migrant children. They are all part and parcel of Christian service. The missionary is no greater than the person who sweeps the floor in the sanctuary. We are all in the same ministry. Whatever we are doing, let us remind ourselves that there will be roadblocks in our Christian life. Maybe not all the six lessons that we have learned this morning will apply to our situation. But I do believe that some of them will be relevant in our own particular situation. So if you hear complaints, if you hear some gossips, if the people afterwards tell you that your coffee is too watery, not sweet enough, not thick enough, don't be disheartened. It's part and parcel. Just look, lesson one to six, try to feed one of them. Okay? Just treat it as a small trial, a small irritation. But what is important, as in Amos, know your calling. The Lord sent me, go. You must be assured of your calling, that your calling to do the job and to do it faithfully as unto the Lord. Amen. Shall we pray? 
our Heavenly Father, our Lord, our Savior, we thank you, Lord, for the many lessons that we can see in this encounter between the true prophet of God and the false priest of a false temple. Father, we want to pray that, Lord, that we may find encouragement as we face roads, blocks, and obstacles in our Christian life and in our service with you. Bless this day to us, Lord, and help us, Lord, to carry this truth in our everyday life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.